the debate is whether or not he is anything more than an eight to ten minute a night guy who just happens to be a, a filler of late minutes so George Niang doesn't have to come in the game. Let's get something very clear here. And this is just my opinion. There's not a chance in the world that Ursan Ilyasova signed with the Jazz to play eight to ten minutes a night. That's just not the reality of his role on this team. And I understand that there are a lot of Rudy Gobert apologists that listen to this show, just so that I'll say his name like that. Uh, But I understand there's a lot of Rudy apologists that listen to this show. If Rudy Gobert is your best only big man option, you're not winning an NBA championship. And I know that's harsh. I know that pisses off Jazz fans. But that's the reality of it. And show me something that tells me I'm wrong about that. Show me something that we've seen either last season or this season that says that Rudy Gobert can be your big man in the last five minutes of a game and he is going to be able to score the basketball to the point where you're going to be able, especially when you're trailing, you're going to be able to come back and win games. Because, Jake, I just don't think that's reality. Yeah, I mean, it's it's no secret that the guy's not an offensive player. You know, that's not, that's not uh, in question. And I think that... Part of this signing was to give them more options, um, you know, at, at the four, maybe a small five. You know, that's that's the whole point of why you would sign this guy, because the rest of the league, any of the contenders have guys who can who can play the five and can shoot. Are they traditional centers? No, but the league doesn't trend towards traditional centers anymore, you know, and so that's that's why this this signing is is not about George Niang. Frankly, George Niang is outperforming his expectations. He shoots well. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't turn the ball over uh, too much when he's playing. Absolutely. And then he goes and sits his ass on the bench, and you never hear about him. That's exactly what his role should be, and who it should be for this squad. The problem is is not George Niang. the The issue is when you're you're down five, headed to the fourth quarter, and Rudy Gobert does not help you. You know, come back in that sense. He plays great defense. Don't get me wrong, but even the best defender in the league can be exploited. Even the even even the defensive player of the year outside of Rudy Gobert can be can be exploited offensively because NBA offenses are that talented, they are that smart, and they are that capable. And so it, it, this really isn't even shade at Rudy, but the point is is that if you're not going to have a jump shot, then you have to you know they they got to find a way to to mitigate that you know, and that's what Ursan's going to do. He's going to come in. I, I don't think he'll see more than twenty minutes a night, frankly. I think he's probably a 15 to 20 minute a night guy, and I think the expectation is that he's going to come in and knock down three to four, three to four threes, and he's going to play good defense. That's the expectation. And if he does that, he's going to play consistently, and the Jazz are going to be better for it. Yeah, that, that my struggle is is that I feel like people, you either have to be a superstar or you're a scrub. That's not who Ursan Ilyasova is. Either way that you slice it, right? Like I think when you look at uh, you look at Ursan, I think his role on this team is going to be, you know, 12 to 17, maybe 20 minutes. I totally agree with you on that. I think he's going to take some minutes away from Rudy. I think he's going to take some minutes away uh, from Bogdanovich. I think what you're going to see is that Ursan Ilyasova is going to play in a variety of situations because he's a big that can shoot the ball. And that's what this team values. And I think um, when you see Rudy come out of the game, you know, five minutes into the first quarter, I think you're going to see a lot of Ilya Sova coming in instead of Derek Favors, depending on the matchup. Um, there were a lot of people on YouTube who said, well, what about, you know, Favors and, and Gobert together? That'll never happen because it's death in this league. Neither one of them runs the floor particularly well. Neither one of them is a finisher on the break. Neither one of them shoots threes. And in this league, you have to be able to get out and be mobile. And that's what Ilya Sova brings you. He's a little bit more willing of a defender, a more capable defender than Bogdanovich. We saw it in the Philly game. We saw it in the Clipper game that that Bogey gets gets turned into a, a, a you know a swinging door when when ha- you have guys that either back him down or take him off the dribble. It's a layup, and certainly it's it's you know backside defensive help. At, the, at a minimum. And many times that turns into an and one play. Yeah, you know? and I'm not saying that Ilya Sova is a better player necessarily than Bogdanovich. I think he's more versatile. I think he can do a few more things defensively. Um, but they both shoot the ball well. I can see situations where Bogdanovich and uh, Ilya Sova are on the floor together. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I can see that in Quinn Snyder's offense. 
But the question is, Jake, are the Utah Jazz still the best team in the NBA? Because, again, after what I saw last night, I'm not sure that the answer is yes right now today. Yeah, I think the the thing, you know, I'm watching the Nets versus the Celtics last night, and, and the thing that really stands out to me is that the Nets are a team that, that really knows how to finish a game. You know, the Nets are a team that isn't, isn't necessarily intimidated to be down um, double digits headed into the half because they know how to finish games. And and the thing is, is that, and this is this kind of plays into the Urson situation. It, it's like the thing is, is that, you know, they can give it to Kyrie who can knock down clutch shots. They can give it to, to James Harden who can knock down clutch shots. And let's say that those two aren't shooting well. Okay, well, those two can also play make. Those two can also play pick and roll and get the defense into foul trouble. And so that's why I say that that the Nets are, are probably, not probably, they, they are the most talented team in the league. But I think the chemistry thing is the biggest question. Kevin Durant hasn't played in probably 25 games now, at least. Uh, you know, it's been a long time. And, and I'm just sitting here thinking, like, dude, like, when are you going to come back? So are the Jazz the best team in the league? I don't think they're better than the Nets, you know, if they matched up. But I do think they're they're right there. They're, they're It obviously would be a close series. So if the best team in the league to me is the Nets, and then I think it's everybody else. But, again, that's an opinion. I don't think there's any question now that what we saw. And you know what really stood out to me about this game last night with the Nets and the Celtics? Mm-hmm. The post-game interview Kyrie Irving did with TNT mm-hmm. was normal. They didn't they like they didn't have to fight to get him. Yeah. He looked like a guy that was not either lit out of his mind <laughs> um or you know he he just looked like a normal dude. And he played like an elite basketball player last night. I see a guy in James Harden that feels like now he's got what he needs to succeed a willing willing passer in James Harden, yeah. a willing defender. I never thought I would say this about James Harden and Kyrie Irving on different teams, let alone the same team. They're working hard defensively. Joe Harris working hard defensively, late game turnover, diving on the floor. Like, this was a complete performance. And, you know, the other thing that I thought was pretty amazing is that James Harden showed toughness against Marcus Smart in the fourth quarter which I thought was really important for this Nets team because I think a lot of people thought that they weren't going to be tough or that they could be had physically. Yeah, I think they're showing that's not the case. The Jazz need to come out of the gates hot. They need to come out shooting the ball well, defending well, breaking people's spirits with the three-pointer. Guys like, and, and, and I know that Donovan's got to get his, and he will get his. It's the Royce O'Neals, the Bogies, the, you know, the Jingles, those guys have to come out lit for the Jazz. Mm-hmm. They need them to to be hot because the Lakers are going to be improved. Right. The Lakers are rested. I think the Lakers are going to get a big and Andre Drummond potentially. Um, I think the Lakers are going to improve. The Jazz are at a real tipping point right now because I think you're also seeing that the Clippers are healthy. Clippers got an easy win last night. Anybody notice it? Wet like on book, mm-hmm. Jake. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't ready for that. Wet like I'm booked. Sorry. Uh, Wet like I'm booked. Uh, sorry. Uh, 35 points last night. Oh, man, I'm well rested. 35 <laughs> points last night from Wet like I'm booked. Mm-hmm. Um, the Suns are legit. And if the Suns go out and make a move, which a lot of people think they're going to, mm-hmm. um, an NBA guy that I trust yesterday called me. We were talking NBA. Yeah, I do that a lot. And he was like, you know that the Suns are shopping DeAndre Ayton. And I'm like, yeah, well, I kind of thought that and been saying that for a year. And the Arizona fans are like, Sean Miller sweats a lot. That doesn't mean they're trading in DeAndre Ayton. I personally would like an apology. Yeah, fuck you, Tucson. Anyway, the point is. You can drive listen, back to Phoenix. Yeah, you can drive back to Phoenix, prick. Um, the point is. <laughs> too much. <laughs> the point is. The Suns are looking to get better because I think the Suns see that. The team they built is ready to compete right now. The Phoenix Suns are ready to win a playoff series. Except DeAndre Ayton holds them back consistently. He does. What do they need? What do the Suns need? They either need a a dynamic wing score that can give them 20, 25 a night, so a Bradley Beal-esque player. Or they need to um, they need to get a big who's more capable. You know, I, I unfortunately we've been saying this. I feel like this happens to us a lot, and it's, and I'm not trying to toot our own horn, but we're right about a lot of things here. And we've been talking about DeAndre Ayton being a terrible defender, 
uh, being somebody that's a liability for your team for two seasons now. And it's nice to hear that they're shopping him. And frankly, I feel like if DeAndre Ayton was a more dominant big, like think about it if you replace DeAndre Ayton with, you know, any of the great bigs in our game, like, you know, again, let's be completely unrealistic and just say Joel, right? If the Suns had Joel, Book, and Chris Paul, they're a championship contender. They're legit. They're a championship contender if they had that kind of production at the five. But because God, the production yeah. is so low for DeAndre Ayton, he's he's soft, number one, and he's just not giving you that presence you need in the middle. There's two routes you can go, and this is what we talk about all the time in the NBA. You've got your small, run-and-gun kind of NBA team, which is what they could do. They could do that. Or you've got your team like the Lakers, who revolves around one or two players, and everybody else is a role player, which is what I think the Suns are, are going to wind up doing, because you've got your two players in Book and CP3. Now you need someone in the middle who's responsible. You need someone in the middle who can get it done for you. You need someone in the middle who's more than happy to go. Who you go, can rely yeah, on. Yeah, you need someone in the middle who's who's more than happy to go yes. and kick someone's ass. Like, you need that. Yes. And that's not the Andre Ayton. And so that's what I think they need. I hope they go and do it. If they got Andre Drummond, I'd be oh, thrilled for man. them. I'd be thrilled for them. I don't know. The, the, thing, the last thing I would say about this is the market for bigs is not deep. It's not like you can just go and find a quality big that's worth actually signing, you know? Because that's the thing. As, as crappy of a player as DeAndre Ayton might be, he is he is he can do things for you offensively. Yeah. So you don't just want to move him for nothing. Like you don't just want to move him for the sake of moving him so you can say, "Well, we got this guy now." Like if you're going to move DeAndre Ayton, it's got to be worth it. Well, and I I don't disagree with that, but I I just look at some of the 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 comments um, you know, that we got and I look at at where we're at with with, you know, Andre Drummond, nothing's changed at this point, right? Like there's been there really has been no no moves. Um, you know, but I, I think it'll be interesting. Like I look at Bradley, um, saying you guys are just always so anti jazz. I feel like you root for them to fail. It's not that we're anti jazz, but the one thing you will probably know already. And if you don't, you should, all we do on this show is we keeps it real. That's it. Like Simple as that, you're going to get right down the middle with us when they're playing well, we're going to say they're the best team in the NBA. When they come out and they drop two duds, we're going to say, Hey, the Clippers got them. And then they went to Philly, and Rudy Gobert got embarrassed. And a lot of their flaws were exposed in that Philly. And, and really, it started with the Clipper game, and then the Philly game. A lot of their a lot of their moles were shown on their face. They took their makeup off. Yeah. And it's not always going to be what you want to hear, but it's going to be the truth. And I think when you look around the Western Conference right now, if I'm a Utah Jazz fan, I am terrified of the Clippers. The Lakers and the Nuggets, terrified. I'm not as worried about the Suns because I think Rudy Gobert in the first three quarters of a game can absolutely change what the Suns do the offensively. The Suns would have to play essentially a perfect game to beat the Jazz, if we're being honest. Like, like Book would have to give him 30. Chris Paul would have to be a 20-10 and 10 kind of guy in a game to beat the Jazz. Like, like they'd have to get a perfect all-around game to beat the Jazz, yes. in my opinion. Yeah. So I agree. I wouldn't be as worried about the Suns, but again... You know, the Nuggets, you should you should be concerned about the Nuggets and what they can do because of the skill position at the five and what Jamal Murray uh, can do. And Michael Porter Jr. is better than he was last year. So that's a team I'd be worried about. I think the Clippers, the Jazz can hang with the Clippers. I, I think the Jazz, there were some learning lessons that happened when they, when they lost to the Clippers. But I also see in that game that the Jazz didn't play well for most of that game. They did not execute at a high level. And so they end up losing the game. The Philly game is the one that I have the most concern about because the Philly game, it wasn't even that the Jazz played all that poorly. They got had mentally. Rudy got his ass kicked. Tobias Harris went after uh, Bogdanovich on the block, kicked his yes. ass too. And so it was more of this like mental thing like, hey, you guys think you're some great team? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and give it to Joel Embiid. He is literally, not exaggerating, literally going to put Rudy Gobert on his back, and then he's going to dunk the basketball and step over him. Yeah. Like, that is the mental edge that Philly can impose on a team. And that's why I think if you're the Jazz or if you're the Suns, you're looking at your roster and you're saying, man, like, if we were to run into, you know, Philly, or if we were to run into a team like the Nuggets that has a dynamic five, what are we going to do Good with luck. that? Like, we have no answer for that. Yeah, and I continue to say, Andre Drummond, this is where we're at in this league. 
Andre Drummond has huge value around the NBA. Now, I think he's making $28, $29 million, so mm-hmm. they're going to have to buy him out in Cleveland. Yeah, Nobody's going to trade for that. But if you're the Utah Jazz, how do you not have interest in Andre Drummond? Now, yeah. Andre Drummond would have to have interest in you, and my guess is with how in love and how many – I'm guessing the Lakers have sent him multiple, uh, you know, dozen roses – chocolate. I want it. You know, like, yeah, they're thirsty for Andre Drummond. Mm-hmm. Like, they are courting him like none other. <laughs> Andre Drummond, I think, would probably give them good consideration. The Lakers, any big would want to go and play for the Lakers. It's very clear at this point that the LA Lakers feel like Marcus Gasol's not the answer in the block, on the block for them, or on top, because he can't defend the low post at the moment. He's not shooting the ball as, it, 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 very well. His mobility is the issue. That's... Yeah, and they tend to slow way down when he's in the game. Yeah. And so you need, you know, it's crazy, and a guy that's not available to them, they need JaVale McGee. Mm -hmm. That's the guy they really need. Um, They need somebody that'll go and blow dudes up at the rim. Yeah. And and he's not, he would have to be traded and then released to another team for the Lakers to be eligible to sign him. Yeah. Um, So it, to me, this is a real tough situation. I think the Lakers want Andre Drummond. Yeah. And I think Andre Drummond, if he gets released, why would you not sign with the Lakers? You're going to contend for a championship at that point. Yeah, well, I think, but I think that same logic applies to the Jazz, too. Like, yeah, the Lakers are a more attractive spot just because AD's hurt and, and you would get right in there, like, for sure. But I also think that the Jazz are, are not a team to be written off in the Andre Drummond, you know, race just because I think if you think about it, like, Andre Drummond is good enough that he would push Rudy. Like, yes, they are very different players, they provide you very different services where Rudy's going to be, obviously, a defensive first guy. Andre Drummond is just a more, uh, he's more that guy who can do many things good. Not one thing great, but many things good. So he's not better than Rudy. He's just different than Rudy. And I think if you're the Jazz, and you're looking at Jokic, and you're looking at Joel, and you're looking at AD if he were to come back, which many people think he will come back for the postseason, and I'm sitting here saying, okay, well, You know, Drummond is no sharpshooter from the elbow, but he can make a jumper here and there. Yeah, He can play a good pick and roll, good enough to earn the respect of the big who's defending him. You know, if we can have that dynamic on the floor, if you're the Jazz, I think that's really attractive to you. But I think the question really becomes, hey, if we sign Andre Drummond, does that hurt some people's feelings? Because that's that typically isn't this team, right? We really don't Not worry typically. about people's feelings getting hurt about signings and things like that. But what does it say to Rudy Gobert if you go and sign Andre Drummond? What message does that send to Rudy and the rest of the squad? I don't know. It, that depends how self-confident Rudy Gobert is. you know. Well, and I, I look at some of the other things we've talked about on this show. Like We got railed by several... Um, I don't know. Would you call them Maverick fans? I have no idea. Uh, I said the other day that Kristaps Porzingis is being shopped by the Dallas Mavericks. And everyone was like, you're an idiot. You're just throwing shit against the wall, fat ass. And I was like, okay, well, hey, look, man. They didn't really throw in the fat. That's me self-deprecating. But anyway, the point is, um, Kristaps Porzingis is being shopped by the Mavericks. And like yesterday, three NBA insiders came out and said, uh, Kristaps Porzingis is being shot by the Mavericks. And it shouldn't be surprising. They have a big financial investment in him, and he hasn't come through. If you're the Lakers, if you, like the Boston Celtics, are heavily linked to Kristaps Porzingis, if you're the Boston Celtics, Got to. And, and you have to. Got to. Right? Like, they're, you're too, oh, let, let me see. Hmm. Do I want LaMarcus Aldridge? Or do I want Kristaps Porzingis, who's shooting the three, he's dunking on guys again. But this is why I don't understand why they want to trade him. He's finally getting here. Like, he's finally producing. Because there's, there's an awkward chemistry on that team. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I think he would bring you a haul. And I, I think they know well, if, that's they, true. That's if true. they keep Porzingis and, and Luka together in Dallas, is, is it really... I mean, are they are they really dangerous in the playoffs? They might win a series at the bottom of the bracket, but that's not a team that's going to contend for an NBA championship. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I I don't I'm see any way. Wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. I just think it's really unfortunate that you know Porzingis has worked his ass off to get through these injuries for you. You know, he's finally back on the floor and being the player you want him to be. 
and now you're gonna trade him. And and I, look, if you're Porzingis, okay, great, trade me to a contender. Okay, cool, like that's fine. But I just think, it, like, if you're the Mavericks, you've you you haven't been good since since really that that Dirk beating of the Miami Heat that was led by LeBron James. You really haven't been anything special since that series. You know, since Dirk went out and won you a championship in a series that you had no business being in. You haven't been anything. And so you go and get Luka. Porzingis is hurt constantly. So what are we doing? So I guess if the mindset is, hey, you know, we're going to make some calls and see what what the market for Kristaps is, and they're getting what they want to hear, then I get it. But my point just is, hey, you finally got the duo that you wanted. You finally don't have to rely on Tim Hardaway Jr. to give you 25 a night. You finally got a guy in Porzingis who's going to produce for you. And now we're going to trade him. And it just seems like a, a – it just makes me say, this is why you're a mediocre team right now. This is why you're not good. Well, and I think very similar to the NFL. I look at what's going on with the the NBA, you know, contract-wise, and I look at what's going on with the NBA cap-wise, and it's becoming very clear to me that owners in the NBA are more willing to part with superstars now – because they've lost significant money. And if you're not going to have a deep playoff run and you're not going to get that playoff money, I think you you realize that guys like like, like Toronto shopping Kyle Lowry is absolutely a, a move that makes sense. I don't I mean, I don't see them winning the Eastern Conference Championship, especially with the way that Philly's playing right now. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know why you would hang on to him when a team um like the, if you think about the Lakers, if you think about, there's so many contenders who could use a legit Kyle Lowry. Could you imagine Kyle Lowry being a Utah Jazz? What yeah. do you The grit replace, and determination. Replace Mike Conley with Kyle Lowry. And all of a sudden you have a guy that's durable and plays. Mm-hmm. And, and makes is, big shots. He's a clutch guy. Come on. Like, I mean, there's there's value in him. The other guy that I, I, I think is, is interestingly available, but nobody really talks about it, is John Collins. Uh, in Atlanta, like I've been reading more and more about him potentially being available. Nobody knows who John Collins is, and he's a badass. Well, he puts up 18 and 9 every night. And he's explosive. You know, like that's a guy you want. And, you know, the the, the interesting team right now, I, I also think, um, is the the uh, New Orleans Pelicans. They were freaking terrible last night. Mm-hmm. They were embarrassingly bad. And immediately during that game, people started tweeting about Lonzo Ball and Josh Hart being available. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, enough with the is he or isn't he. If you're going to deal with Zion Williamson as your number one guy, which I think is a huge mistake, I will continue to say it. and, And please note, I've said this since day one, that the great thick hope came into the league, that Zion Williamson will never be in elite basketball shape. He will never be an elite scorer. He's a great finisher at the rim. It's cool that he can dunk, but that's all he's got. And I'm telling you, he is not a good free throw shooter, which drastically diminishes his value. Yes, he's a young player. Yes, he can improve. But guys who are of his profile, which is bigger, thicker, weight management guys, are rarely ever, ever meaning the top of their potential. So they're going to wind up staying with him because public perception tells you you have to. But I'm telling you, they should trade Lonzo Ball and Josh Hart and get value in return. Trade J.J. Redick, get value in return because they need to move on from what they have now. And guys like J.J. Redick that eat space, he absolutely, J.J. Redick, and I don't know that people really value him for this, J.J. Redick creates space for the other four guys on the floor. You have to respect his jump shot. Yeah, you can't leave him open. Right? Like, you You have have to to. respect J.J. Redick, so he creates space. And I'm telling you now, you trade him, you trade Lonzo or Josh Hart, you're going to get value in return. Yeah. Because all three of those guys are are offense for you. Lonzo Ball's jump shot right now is, is really strong. And, and I would think it, him, look at a guy like Buddy Heald in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. Buddy Heald's the guy that's a knockdown three-point shooter. How long have we been talking about him and Bagley being available in Sacramento? Yeah, I mean, they're the ultimate mediocre team. I mean, they're a team that's got some nice players but are never going to do anything because the of The Black West. Falcon. Yeah. Harrison Barnes is another guy that's available. Yeah. Right? And his 
his ability now to stop turning the ball over mm-hmm. and his ability now to to willingly stop and take mid-range jumpers has gone away. He's actually, again, going to the basket instead of settling for a jump shot. Yeah. I mean, his value is exponentially higher now. Right. There's talent available. If you really want to go and get it and get guys to improve your team in your situation, I'm telling you there are guys available, and it's teams like the Lakers, the Celtics, um, the, if Suns. You, it, the Suns that are willing to go out and get that talent and pay that money. And the Suns have never been this team, but I think with the CP3 deal, they showed you they are now. Yeah. They're willing to pay guys because they can win right now. Yeah. They can win right now. And I just, I wonder if the Jazz are, are committed to that kind of thinking, right? Like, I wonder if, are you willing to go and get an Andre Drummond? Are you willing to, what if, what if you went and got a guy like Kevin Love out of Cleveland? I like Andre Drummond more than Kevin Love for their team because I already think they've got plenty of shooting. They yeah. need a guy in the middle who's who's a physical presence. And uh, I think Kevin Love is he's an elite rebounder. He is not what he used to be, but he'll still give you as a role player, he'll still give you six to ten rebounds a night. Yeah. And he can absolutely knock down the three ball in this league. Yeah. So he can stretch the paint yeah. and he can defend the paint. I think yeah, he brings I, a lot of value. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that he doesn't. I'm saying for what the Suns need, I think Andre Drummond's a better fit simply because they don't need shooting. You know, they, they have, you've got Book, you've got CP3, you've got Cam Johnson, you've got Mikhail Bridges. All those guys can shoot the ball, you know, at a high level. And and so when I look at what's missing, what's yep. missing is a guy in the middle who's a bruiser, a guy in the middle who is big. He is a big, big. Like he is somebody who he, he, he knows how to fill up space in the paint and be like, hey, this is my space. I'm going to get this board. Right. It's over. Right. You know? right. So I think they need that. But listen, if they got Kevin Love, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I mean, yes, he can still contribute. I would just rather see them go and get Drummond. I don't think there's a team in the league that can say it's the end of the world if you add Kevin Love. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I, I think there's a lot of value in that. But hey, here nor there, I think the Jazz have to go and make a significant addition if they want to win a championship. Because. When you have guys like Kyrie and Harden and Durant, you've gone out and built your team. Yeah, uh, you have guys like AD and LeBron. I what are you what are you feeling on AD? I just think that they they're not in a rush to bring him back, and they shouldn't be. You know, they 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 you win the championship yeah. last year. You know, again, this is that public perception conversation we were just having with Zion. You know, public perception would tell you, well, you got to get him back. You know, we're we're making the postseason push now, and it's like, no, dude. Don't have to get him back. LeBron LeBron is aging out of the league now. He's coming to the end. It's happening. We're watching it happen. And AD is your future. And do you, do you really want your future to be put on a in an Achilles tear? Do you really want that to happen? And I think at this point, the problem is, and I'm no doctor, I'm no expert, could be wrong, but it feels like this whole Achilles lower calf strain issue for guys is not an issue that goes away once it's an issue. It seems like once it happens to you, eventually you're going to blow that thing up. Eventually. It's like it, it's just like it's too it's tired. It's had too many miles on it and you're breaking down. They're 3 and 6 since he went down February 2nd. Yeah. They're not the same team without him. We should get an update tonight, Friday, March 12th. He'll be reevaluated. Um and likely after the game the Lakers will have an update on Anthony Davis. But I think it only adds to the urgency of getting Andre Drummond. Yeah. Um, because I think you have enough guys that can score the basketball. If you bring Andre Drummond in, he's going to help you. You're going to get tremendous defensive value out of him. Yeah. You're not going to need him to score. He will score. You're not going to need him to score. So I think he brings tremendous value to you. And I think you can win a championship if he's if he's your starting five. Yeah, it's not Anthony Davis, but I think he helps because I think he can guard guys like Jokic. Mm-hmm. I he do. Can stay foot speed wise, he can yeah. stay with them. Yeah, no so I think it'll be interesting to to see what they do. I I think I I look at some of the other stories around the leagues, um, you know, and I I just wonder, um, you know, what are the what are the what are the Sixers going to do here? Because I think this COVID thing without Embiid and Simmons, by the way, they, they beat the Bulls last night without Embiid and Simmons. <laughs> Tell me again that Zach Levine's not available. Mm-hmm. Tell me again that, you know, Porter is not available. Like, come on. Who are, who are we kidding? Um, but if you look at, at what, they're, what they're doing, um, I think it's interesting that 
if the Sixers get guys like PJ Tucker, yeah, I think that's that, the guy they need because they have a lot of talent on that team. Ben Simmons is a great distributor. If you can have a guy standing in the corner who can knock it down at like yeah. thirty-eight to forty percent, that's huge. Yeah, I don't know. I I think it is. I think it is interesting, and it will be interesting to see. What happens to a guy like a you know these lesser guards, the Eric Gordons, the um, Delon Wrights, Victor you know, Oladipo? Yeah, what? Well, and I, I put Vic in a different cat. I still don't think he's that available in Houston. I think he wants to be available. I don't think he's that available. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know what it would take to get him out of Houston, but Oladipo and John Wall together are, is pretty formidable. It is. It's good. I don't know that I I'd be wanting to break that up, but. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's interesting to see, you know, where do the Sixers go? Are you are you going to go get a Will Barton or a DeLon Wright? Are you going to go get a P.J. Tucker? P.J. Tucker, yeah. I probably wouldn't be going to get DeLon Wright. I, I think it's yeah. it's not it's just not worth the time to go and get him. I, I, he's just, there's not enough upside there. But, yeah, I, I think that P.J. Tucker is, a again, a physical guy who fits mm. right in with the presence of that team and the identity of that team, and I think he can knock down the corner three. If you could swap Will Barton for Danny Green, they're almost a perfect salary mix, I would do it in a second. Yeah. I would. I, I would. I'd absolutely. You wouldn't do that? That like, That's not intriguing to you. I mean, it's intriguing, but it's not like, man, like Danny Green's so old and slow that we need to move him. Like, it's not there yet. He's not knocking the three down the way he used to. Danny Green misses. He used to live and die on that corner three, and he's di- he's dead. Yeah. Like, that corner three is not going for, for yeah. Danny Green. Like, if you truly have Eastern Conference championship hopes, you need to defend better, and you absolutely need to shoot the three better. Yeah. I. Yeah, I don't disagree. I just think that Will Barton is not a good enough player to to go out and you know spend significant time trying to trade for him. Like that's just not. He he, he doesn't make much money. Him and Danny Green make the same money. And if yeah. you want to pay pay a guy that money, I'll take Barton over Danny Green. Danny Green looks like he's in pain when he's walking, <laughs> right? Okay. There's a reason he's not a Laker anymore. Yeah. <laughs>